there is somebody that even before you were thinking about the health of GI tract, and that was Hippocrates. And he said in 418 BC that all diseases begin in the gut. So there you are. Research is proving him right. What are probiotics? It, the term was coined, uh, it's a Greek term, and it was coined in 1965 by two microbiologists. They were looking through a double head microscope and they were looking at a culture and there were some colonies of bacteria there and one was secreting a substance that stimulated the growth of the other colony so they called that material a probiotic. Well the term evolved over the years and probiotics were used in agriculture, it's been used in the food industry and then it was being used in medicine and in 2001 there really wasn't a lot of structure about probiotics and so there was this international meeting uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the World or Health Organization that, and they were bringing some organization to what probiotics are and one thing is that they came up with the terminology of what a probiotic is and anytime you read an article about probiotic this statement appears so they're live microorganisms when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host so a probiotic is a live microorganism it can be bacteria or yeast able to and to be a candidate the, the bacteria are usually taken from healthy humans and they're now looked at to see whether they could potentially be a probiotic. But to be a candidate, they have to survive the gastric acid, not destroyed by pancreatic digestive enzymes and bile acids. They have to be shown to reach the colon and to adhere to the intestinal linings and then they colonize. And obviously they have to be non-pathogenic, non-toxic and free of significant side effects. And once they reach that point, then they have to do animal studies to see what the benefit is of these particular bacteria. And each bacteria has a different function. So these are common ones that we're all aware of. So there's lactobacillus, a very common bifidobacteria, streptococcus, saccharomyces. So not only do you have the genus and the, and the species, but then you have strains. So if you happen to use a particular probiotic that you said, well, it's got lactobacillus acidophilus, and you go out to buy another lactobacillus acidophilus, it may be a different strain and it may have a different impact on the intestinal tract. Well, how do they work? Well, they act as an intestinal barrier, they modulate the intestinal immune response, they support intestinal function and motility, and as an intestinal barrier, they adhere to the intestinal lining cells, they compete for colonization of the intestinal lining. So if someone's going to take a trip to a third world country, and they're going to be exposed to potential pathogens in uh, contaminated food and drink. If you take a probiotic and you can line your intestinal tract with the good guys, then if you ingest a bad bug, it makes it less of easy for that bug to find a niche to set up housekeeping or invade. In addition, the probiotics produce bacteria and defensins. These are proteins that will pierce the wall of the back bad bacteria and destroy them. Never knew this. I, it's fascinating. They decrease the luminal pH because the uh, probiotic bacteria ferment resistant starches, starches that we don't have the enzymes to break down, and then they get into the colon, and then in the process of fermentation, release the uh, acidic acid, butyric acid, and propionic acid. These are short chain fatty acids. Well, but it reduces the pH, and Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli don't do well with that, so it's a protective part of for us. So the probiotic bacteria uh, stimulate the intestinal epithelial cells to produce uh, proteins that pre maintain tight junctions. They also stimulate mucus production by the goblet cells, and that's another helpful barrier against any harmful bacteria or other toxins. Uh, they modulate the immune system. So 70% of our immune system is in the intestines. Probiotics stimulate the growth and the function of the immune system. The intestinal immune systems do a surveillance. As I said earlier, they're constantly monitoring what's coming in and they can decide whether it's something they develop tolerance to or amount of reaction to. And then the probiotics crosstalk with the immune system and that gives a signal of tolerance or immune reaction and uh, Helen Goldberg can tell us a lot more than I can about this whole area. But here's a slide. So here's the epithelial cells. Here's the mucus layer. Here's the good guys. Probiotics are sitting right against the wall and uh, they're producing the bactericins that will destroy the bad guys. Two, they're competitive inhibiting other bugs from getting down onto the wall here. They also produce um, molecules that will inhibit 
the bacterial adhesion and translocation through the wall of bad bacteria. Four, they reduce the luminal pH, which we talked about before. Five, they stimulate the mucus production. And six, there is the tight proteins that maintain the tight junction, so nothing uh, can get through. It won't affect our immune system. Down here in the lamina propria, we have the uh, lymph, lymph, lymph tissue and the mesenteric lymph nodes. So that was the, our innate immunity, and now we have the adaptive immunity, how we develop antibodies and cellular immunity. So this is just a quick slide, but it really has a lot to do with what I'm going to say later. So here is a dendritic cell, right? Okay, so it's down here in the uh, submucosa, and it's sending a branch up to see what's out into the, in, the, in the lumen and along the mucosa here. And each dendritic cell is genetically already predetermined to have on its surface a toll-like receptor, and it's looking for the uh, pathogen-associated molecular pattern that's on bacteria. Every bacteria has a specific code protein, and our immune system can recognize it. So if it's a good guy, then it doesn't have an immune reaction. If it's a bad guy, it's ready to do a reaction. So that's still part of the innate system. And then it moves down, and it sends uh, cytokines uh, to our lymph, our, our lymph cells in the mycosa here. We have these T cells. There's two particularly. There's a Th1 helper cell. That has to do with our cellular immunity. And if it's stimulated, it produces interferon, tumor necrosis factor, that causes inflammation, and uh, there are so many of the drugs out there that treat uh, uh, a lot of the immune mediated disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and you see them advertised all the time, Humira, Embrel, and their tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. So in addition, there are uh, Th2 helper cells, and they stimulate the immunoglobulins to make antibodies. And so, uh, again, they're, con they're because w the way we evolved, we evolved with these bacteria and uh, parasites and viruses, and our immune system had to learn to deal with them. And so that is how it all happened. And then we have this other cell called a regulatory T cell. And when it's stimulated, it downregulates the inflammation. So this is just an overview. There is the mucus, there is the epithelial letters, layers, there is the bacteria trying to invade. Here's our immune system, and here's the lymph node. In the center is the B cells or the immunoglobins, and the T cells are on the outside. And once they're stimulated, they go through the lymphatics, they go through the thoracic duct, they're in the blood, and then they go back and populate the submucosa of the intestinal tract. But they also go to the respiratory tract and other places too. But they're already now loaded and ready to deal with certain in, in, in contact with different kinds of uh, antigens or that they may come in contact with. So it's an intestinal barrier, it interacts with their immune response, and it supports intestinal function and motility. So I mentioned several times about resistant starches. Um, we know that they're in wheat bran, bananas, onions, leeks, artichokes, and we call them fructooligosaccharides. You're always told to eat a lot of fiber. There are some of the fibers digestible, some isn't. Um, and, but the bacteria are have so many more enzymatic systems than we do. We have sucrase, isomaltase, lactase, but that's just a limited amount of the uh, enzymes that break down polysaccharides. The GI tract, the bacteria can do a much greater job, but what they do is they produce these uh, short-chain fatty acids, and they're signaling between these uh, short-chain fatty acids and the development of their immune system. What's really interesting is butyrate if someone has like a terrible uh, diverticulitis in the sigmoid colon and they have a perforation, the surgeon goes in and defunctionalizes the bowel and makes a temporary ileostomy. So they have a drainage to the outside. Then six weeks later, they go in and they resect the infected area and close it up, reanastomosis, re and then six weeks later, they put everything back together again. What I saw in private practice would people would develop this bloody diarrhea even though they weren't hooked up. And it was, you'd look in the colon and it would look like somebody took sandpaper and scraped the lining of the bowel. And it was due to the fact that butyrate is uh, a necessary um, carbohydrate or a, a, a nourishment for the colon lining cells. So as it's absorbed, it gives energy. And if you, someone has this terrible, it's called diversion colitis. If you give the person a butyrate enema, it will clear it up. Isn't that amazing? Just, I think it's terrific. Propionate. 
and acetate will go through the uh, portal system, go to the liver, and it has a lot of signaling to decide where those energy calories that you're absorbing are going to go. They'll go to either fat or you'll burn them. And we'll talk about how obesity has a huge impact on the diversity of the bacteria and will affect our health. Here's another thing that the probiotic bacteria do, which I wasn't aware of. So methane is one of the gases that are produced in fermentation, but it's only probably in about 50% of us because you've got to have this special, it's not even a bacteria, but it's like a bacteria, but it ferments starches and produces methane. So when you drive by a dairy farm, you know what methane smells like. So methane in the gut, it's a gas, and it will inhibit the neuromuscular junction in the GI tract. And so instead of getting the normal contraction wave with peristalsis, it causes the bowel to contract, but there's no uh, peristalsis. And people who have a lot of methane production have a lot of constipation. So when you give a probiotic to them, you displace the methane-producing bacteria, you lower the methane level, and their stools will be normal. And I didn't even know that when I developed a probiotic, and people started to tell me about they themselves or a family member who all of a sudden had normal stools, and I wasn't aware that that was one of the benefits of probiotics. This is interesting. So bile acids are very important in the absorption of fat. The liver makes them. They're stored in the gallbladder. Once we eat a fat, the gallbladder contracts. The bile acids are put into the intestines. They emulsify the fat and help for its digestion with lipase. Uh, the probiotic bacteria uh, can deconjugate the bile acids because normally after they do their job, they go through the small intestines and get reabsorbed and go back to the liver, liver and they're recycled. But if you interrupt that pathway by deconjugating them, they go out in the stool. Well, the liver is constantly making a sterol that either will make bile acids or it will make cholesterol. So if you reduce the amount of bile acids or to reabsorb, the liver has to spend more time making bile acids and less cholesterol, and so probiotic bacteria have been shown to lower total and LDL cholesterol. Not much, 7 to 10%, but it makes a difference. Um, they inhibit carcinogens. If you epidemiologically in the world, uh, colon cancer is very common in the industrialized world because of our diet. We eat a lot of animal fat, we eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, the fat uh, and, the, and the meat, uh, the, there's products that we don't digest that get in the colon and will influence which bacteria are there and they can produce potential carcinogens. So there's no study that's showing eating a healthy or taking probiotics will lessen a colon cancer, but we all know eating a healthy diet will potentially lessen colon cancer. I mean, those studies have been shown. But it's fascinating how the gut bacteria have such an impact in so many areas. So here's someone taking a probiotic, escaping the acid of the stomach, it's getting not destroyed by the bile acids or the pancreatic enzymes, moves through the small intestines and makes it to the colon and adheres to the mucus layer and sets up how he can be and does all the immune uh, interactions and all the production of the short-chain fatty acids. So that's the background.